and we'll be looking at this one in just a second, once we've had a chat with the director of the Henry Jackson Society, that's Ellen Mendoza, who is uh, joining us to talk about the situation in Ukraine, what we do about it, what Europe does about it. Alan, uh, I was mentioning earlier that Vitaly Klitschko, many of our viewers will remember uh, the Klitschko uh, brothers, heavyweight boxing champions both, but also politicians, Vitaly at least, uh, mayor of Kiev right now, is also training to be a reservist uh, should th the firing begin in Ukraine. But he's been very critical in an article in a German newspaper of the behaviour of the Germans. Uh, this idea that there's a unified European response, it's for the birds. Oh, completely, yes. I mean, I think that the, particularly it's right to single out the Germans. It is the most powerful economy in Europe. It is the economy that has uh, much to do with trade with Russia and economic sort of... Uh, Again, uh, through Russian uh, investment and trade, we've got the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline, and the Germans are sitting on their hands on this issue, saying they support sanctions, but not quite clear what sanctions those are, um, and generally foot-dragging compared to the attitudes of some of their neighbours to the East in particular, and of course us to the West, um, who are much more concerned about what's going on. It was just this feeling, isn't there, Colin, that uh, the Germans might be inclined to put economic benefit above uh, European uh, unity, to use that phrase, on a matter of European security. Well, I'll tell you what, Alan, we're, we're talking a lot today and have been um, in recent days about pol you know, political corruption of one form or another um, and whether hosting a party at Downing Street amounts to something nefarious. I'll tell you what's nefarious. The idea of a former ruler of a country the size of Germany, biggest country in Europe, uh, like Gerhard Schroeder, former Chancellor of Germany, who is by many measures now effectively in the pocket of uh, Moscow. Uh, now, that's a scandal. That really is a scandal. Some of the lobbying he's been doing on behalf of Putin, uh, and I th you know, widely out there in the public domain. Many of our viewers here in the UK won't be aware of it. But it puts a different gloss entirely uh, once, you, once you realize just how serious politicians have cozied up to Moscow. It puts an entirely different gloss on that relationship between Germany and Russia. Yes, completely. I think that you know the, the Kremlin has been very clever about uh, reaching out to uh, uh, German politicians and indeed, of course, others across Europe uh, who might further their agenda. Um, in some cases, it's very classic in the sense of um, you will, you know, basically uh, be paid lots of money to work for Russian companies, and uh, therefore, you know, we know where your loyalties will lie financially. In other cases, uh, it may be more subtle. But the reality is that a tremendous effort has been made, of course, to uh, employ people. Who could be of use in political discussions uh, when it comes to uh, action against Russia. And there's no doubt that the Russians and now, of course, increasingly other countries like China have been using um, sort of the, the lure of personal gain in some cases to uh, perhaps cloud judgments about what might be the best uh, national response from certain countries. Alan, how could, how could the Germans have got this so wrong on energy policy? I mean, energy policy sounds really dull, doesn't it? But actually, it's really dramatic in the sense that if you ditch your nuclear programme and find you've suddenly got this yawning gap in your energy supply and you're working out how you keep the lights on, then suddenly you find yourself having to cosy up to some fairly unscrutable characters, building pipelines all the way effectively to import Russian gas. They've made a real hash of things, the Germans. Yes, I'm not, I, look, I know we're singling out the Germans right now and they do deserve, as I said, uh, to be uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, kind of jolt towards more action. But the reality is that much of Europe is in a similar position. They've allowed themselves to become dependent on uh, Russian gas in particular. And as a result, it's very difficult when you allowed yourself to be dependent or to have a significant proportion of your uh, gas coming from uh, one location. It's difficult to stand up to someone who's actually your main uh, gas supply, particularly in the middle of winter. So it's a pretty standard issue. People have ignored it in the past, thinking, oh, this day will never come, we can reason. And of course, there is always an argument, isn't there, a sort of circular argument that says, oh, no, they will be hurt much more than us if they cut off the, uh, the gas, uh, but, uh, because they won't get the money, of course, from the trade. But at the same time, what I don't think you know, Europeans have perhaps factored is that Vladimir Putin is willing to perhaps take the hit in exchange for pursuing his megalomaniac ambitions. And that's probably something that's just alien to the European mindset today, that there are people out there who might still be aggressors and who can't be sort of reasoned out of it. Alan Mendoza, as ever. Alan, thanks very much indeed. Let's turn then to Shirelle.